we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we have prepared a fact pattern for our presentation. I'll be uh, starting by introducing the panel, and uh, I'll read you the fact pattern, and we're going to do a little role play. So um, try to mix it up a little bit. Um, my name is Paul Carl Scott. I'm a partner with Baker and Hostetler in Denver, Colorado. Um, my practice is uh, focused on defending class actions in the U.S., uh, primarily in the privacy space these days, uh, so mostly consumer class actions involving data breaches or uh, other privacy-related claims. Um, with me today, um, to uh, my immediate right, uh, is Kenny Henderson from CMS. Um, Kenny has represented both claimants and defendants in collective and class action proceedings. He's been involved in many of the highest profile collective proceedings in Europe and is uniquely situated to advise clients both in defending and in reducing exposure uh, in opt-in and opt-out collective action proceedings. Um, and by the way, CMS acted for two of the interveners in the Lloyd and Google case, so, uh, and we'll, we'll be addressing that um, uh, as many of the other panels have as well. Um, to uh, his right, is Mike Peerless. Uh, Mike Peerless is from Mackenzie Lake. Uh, and uh, Mike is uh, a Canadian lawyer who helped certify the first class action in Ontario in the early 1990s. Uh, he now represents plaintiffs and defendants in class actions and has truly written the book on class actions in Canada. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, Jeremy Schur. Uh, from DLA Piper. He is the head of DLA Piper's Global Class Actions Group in the UK uh, and um, is originally from Australia, so has that perspective as well. Um, he is an international disputes lawyer who has particular expertise defending clients in cases with a cross-border element and reputational implications. So thank you all to our distinguished panelists. Um, now I'll read you the fact pattern. Uh, so we'll be um, role-playing based on the following. Headspace Corp is a social media company. Oh, first of all, I should say, um, these are all ficti fictitious characters and companies. Uh, any resemblance to actual companies is purely coincidental. Um, Headspace Corp is a social media company headquartered in Seattle, Washington, USA, founded in 1915, or 1915, 2015. Uh, since its founding, Headspace has attracted more than 900 million users ABCXYZ Limited is a multinational UK-based media company that wholly owns Yeehaw NV, a global web services provider headquartered in The Hague, Netherlands, with approximately 1.5 billion active users. Both Headspace and Yeehaw offer targeted advertising and data analytics services to companies around the world. Combined, these two companies control roughly 60% of the worldwide digital advertising market. Recently, the former CTO of Headspace, 29-year-old Curtis Cobain, that's C-O-B-A-Y-N, <laughs> gave a highly publicized expose interview with British tabloid The Looking Glass in which he confessed that he and other high-level executives of Headspace had conspired with top executives of both X or ABC XYZ and Yeehaw to combine forces to control the digital advertising market by secretly developing and sharing a new persistent cookie technology known as Chronic Biscuit, used to capture web user web browsing activities and to share and exploit the resulting data in an effort to control the worldwide digital advertising market. Numerous private bloggers and data security analysts quickly began publishing articles substantiating Cobain's claims about the apparent existence of chronic biscuit artifacts on the computers and mobile devices of both Headspace and Yeehaw users. Some of these analysts claim that the technology can be used to track internet users even if they are not also users of Headspace or Yeehaw. So days after all of these revelations, Mike Peerless was approached by a Quebec-based digital advertising company, Maple Leaf Media, about the possibility of bringing a competition action in Canada against both Headspace and Yeehaw. Uh, Peerless has been in touch with plaintiff's lawyers in the United States, Australia, and the UK who are considering bringing similar actions. He has been contacted by Claude von Trapp, a Swiss graduate student and privacy rights advocate who has been organizing an initiative to bring mass privacy complaints to various European regulators. 
Um, Jeremy Schur and his firm have been retained by Headspace to coordinate its defense to competition, uh, antitrust, and privacy claims worldwide, as well as defending against enforcement actions by privacy regulators in the UK and the EU. Kenny Henderson and his firm have been retained to represent both ABC XYZ and Yeehaw in a similar capacity. And I have been separately engaged by Headspace to defend several class actions brought um, uh, in the Washington uh, courts by Washington residents uh, alleging various common law and statutory claims arising out of alleged invasions of privacy due to the use of the chronic biscuit technology. Um, I have also been approached uh, by a U.S. firm representing Yeehaw in similar litigation brought in federal court about forming a joint defense group in defending the U.S.-based privacy litigation. Uh, and we've also been in contact with others who are defending against antitrust claims in the United States. So that sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. Now, I'll start with Mike Peerless uh, because he is, this is a panel about defense, but he's, so he's the, the bad guy. Uh, he's the plaintiff's lawyer. Um, <laughs> and um, Mike, uh, t tell us a little bit about um, how, how in this scenario um, the various plaintiff's groups are going to be coordinating their strategy, and then the rest of us can talk about sort of how we'll defend against that. Sure. Um, and first of all, I like to be the bad guy, so that's good. Second of all, as a Canadian lawyer, when you talk about a biscuit, the only thing we can he I, I hear is a hockey puck. That's what we call <laughs> a, the biscuit bulging the twine. But so, so, so here, here's the thing. Um, as, a, as a plaintiff's class action lawyer, I do a lot of cases that, that cross borders. And we, we, we uh, plaintiff's lawyers have, have a, a essentially, we always want to do the same thing. And that is we want to create maximum havoc for the defendants. Because the more havoc we can create, the more likelihood that, that a defendant will come to the table with money, which um, there were comments earlier about it's too bad that class actions are about lawyers because lawyers are about the money, but most of us here are lawyers and we're making money on these class actions. It is true, we have to, so as plaintiff's lawyers, um, we don't want to take great cases and go to trial and win the appeal and then win at the Supreme Court in the various uh, jurisdictions because for our clients, that's really a terrible result because it's very slow. What we really want is to drive a settlement. So maximum havoc. So yes, um, what we would be doing is, um, is communicating with, with lawyers in, in, in many jurisdictions and talking about getting cases filed. Um, we, we wouldn't worry too much right at the beginning about which ones to do first. We would just want to get them going. So in Canada, we would be starting uh, privacy cases and securities cases and probably consumer cases with, against these defendants uh, on the grounds that the devices themselves, people's uh, electronic devices, um, have been tampered with. Essentially, if there are cookies, biscuits that are being left behind unknowingly with respect to uh, services that you haven't even signed up for, um, then there would be, an, a, there'd be a, a real argument under Canadian law that that would be a trespass to property, and so you could have a property claim against all of these um, defendants as well. Um, so we would be starting those cases. We would start them in Quebec, which is a civil law jurisdiction, and in other provinces in Canada, which are common law jurisdictions. Those are different kinds of cases. Um, it adds to the complexity for the defendants to have to respond to both types at the same time in Canada. Um, and we would be talking to UK lawyers uh, in England and Scotland, for sure. We would be talking to um, Dutch lawyers who, who we know and who we do some, some of these kinds of work with. Um, and we'll be coordinating with Americans and with, with people in other countries, now including Portugal, thank you. Um, and, but, but all of that would be done probably under the auspices of some loose form of plaintiff's steering committee, um, not a formal one like you would see under US uh, multi-district litigation, but an informal group of lawyers who would get together and say, how are we gonna run this? First, get it started, put pressure on in as many places as possible, and then realistically, most of the jurisdictions would sit back to at least some extent and watch what happens in the United States because for the most part, um, Canada shares the world's longest undefended border with the United States. Um, all of our TV uh, shows come from the United States. We, uh, we, we absorb most of the US uh, culture, but we still, the, the United States drives the, these things because 
because the United States, unlike, um, unlike the UK and Canada, doesn't really have an a, a, a adverse costs regime. So people are willing to take more uh, dramatic steps. In Canada, we do have a, an adverse costs regime, a, the, the English rule. Um, and, and so we're a little bit more hesitant to take some things forward. And also, we don't really have punitive damages in Canada, and we don't have jury trials for most civil matters, so we don't have big jury judgments. But, so we would start everything, and then we would see what the American plaintiffs and courts were doing. And, and just a follow-up question to that, you talked about what the private lawyers are, are doing. Um, this is a situation that's likely to get the attention of regulators. What about coordination with uh, government regulators? So, so that would be very interesting. So one of the, one, again, one of the first things we would do in Canada is we would contact the securities regulators. We have, the, 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 we have lots of friends there. Um, we would talk to the competition regulators. We have friends there as well. Um, and we would, see, we would see if they have investigations going and we would encourage them to start them if they didn't and we would provide them with all the information we had and that we could share. Um, they, regulators in Canada don't share much back in the other direction but they, they're happy to receive um, things from us. Certainly the same kinds of discussions would be going on in the United States and uh, although I'm not really aware of how it would be done in, in Europe, as a North American lawyer, um, we see European regulatory authorities taking much more interventionist plays most of the time than, uh, than North American regulators, except in a few, few times in antitrust, uh, sometimes in securities cases, occasionally in uh, the Department of Justice will take something on. I know in the Dieselgate cases with Volkswagen, uh, the US Department of Justice was very involved because uh, they felt they'd been lied to um, directly and they they don't like that. So, Now, I'll start with Kenny. Um, you, you are now representing um, both the parent company and Yeehaw, uh, the uh, uh, website company, uh, in whatever litigation has just been brought against you, as Mike's described it. Um, describe kind of how you go about starting to coordinate all this litigation. You're, you've been pegged as the, the lead lawyer that's charged with coordinating all the litigation worldwide. and. Um, and where do you start and what's sort of the gold standard for this, this coordination of defense? Sure. So um, these are obviously risk-driven situations and there'll be um, uh, uh, publicity, uh, reputational risk, they'll be dealing with regulators, but in purely on the litigation side, it'll be important to have an overview of where the exposure is, particularly in Europe. And um, that is really being driven, the procedural changes are being driven at, at two levels. Firstly is the EU itself, and we've got the representative action directive, um, and that's basically imposing a floor of minimum procedural standards across member states. The floor is not particularly high, but it is a floor, and those, those, those countries can go beyond that floor. So the, uh, I'm not going to go into huge amounts of details about the representative action directive, don't worry, but they are, the claims will be brought by qualified entities, um, and it requires that member states have an opt-in mechanism at least, but it permits the member states to have an opt-out mechanism. So what we're seeing all over Europe right now is these countries considering whether or not what they should be doing, should they go beyond the minimum standards? And so that is prompting a lot more of the opt-out mechanisms in the next few years likely, likely coming to Europe. And it's, so it's a fluid system. Um, so it's important to be aware of what, is, what are the current procedural uh, areas of concern and also what is changing. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Then of course, we've got things happening and instigated purely at the country level, but the Netherlands uh, with their opt-out mechanism, we heard, heard about, um, of course, Portugal, uh, the great great summary of what's happening in Portugal, and then we've got the UK, which is now having buckets of opt-out risk. We've got the op uh, we've got the Competition uh, Act, which was introduced by Parliament in 2015, and then of course we've got Lloyd and Google, which uh, um, you know potentially is opening up areas outside of data protection as well. So it is it's a complex picture, um, and then what's very important as well is to understand what's coming down the line, because some of these changes when they come in, they have got um, they've got retrospective impact. When, uh, when the, uh, the competition mechanism came in in the UK, the first claim, Pride and Mobility Scooters, there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a wrinkle in that mechanism, but it has got a retrospective impact to an extent. And of course, the defendants in that case understandably made natural justice, human rights, retrospective application arguments, which were rejected, including because uh, that was just a change to procedural law. It wasn't an impact on substantive rights. And so the, court, the, the tribunal was comfortable allowing that, that to proceed. 
So you've got to get, you've got to get a, an overview of what the local procedural laws are and where are the buckets of risk, and that will, that will really drive a lot of your defense, uh, defense strategy, where, 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 where to be concerned about. You know, as, as Mike already mentioned, a lot of it is driven by the US, and that often will be you know, what, what is driving uh, the, you know, the dog, not the tail here, you know, quite rightly, that will be driving where the exposure is and where the risk is, but that's not always the case. You know, in the trucks litigation, you know, that's very much a European scenario, and there will be other matters as well. So you've got to get, a, get, a, get, a, get ahead of that and understand uh, wh where you're likely to face the very big cases. That would be the first thing to be doing. Then also considering the regulatory position as well. Um, traditionally in Europe, Europe, in kind of B2B, uh, uh, competition litigation. It's very much been follow-on litigation, even more so in concealed cartels, because they're very hard to prove, they're very hard to, to get, get a hold of the evidence, and, and, and with adverse costs, particularly in the UK, that's quite an unattractive claim. Um, so that has traditionally been the way, but with the lower, with introduction of opt-out class actions, and the low certification threshold from uh, Merix and MasterCard, that's quite an attractive uh, arrangement uh, for, for claimant law firms. And um, we, uh, there, it, it also puts um, pressure on them to an extent because, for what, well, for one thing, there's an opportunity. They don't need to build a book, of course, with an opt-out mechanism, the class coalesces, but they're also concerned with carriage disputes. You know, they, they want to move fast as well, so there's the opportunity and the impetus to file claims much more quickly. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of those sorts of claims. And the point I'm making on this scenario is, you know, in-house lawyers can't assume that we've got the kind of linear life cycle of regulatory action, then litigation. We're going to see much more litigation at an earlier stage, um, as I think we have in this scenario um, here as well. So those are kind of, we've got kind of the, the geographical mapping of risk, thinking about the life cycle as well, and then the usual piece around um, PR, PR concerns as well, the public narrative. Okay, now Jeremy and I share a client. Um, He's leading the global effort. Um, I have this, what appears to be a little case in Washington State that I'm handling, um, which, by the way, has a billion dollars of exposure uh, because they're <laughs> statutory damages. But um, from your perspective as sort of the, the global coordinator uh, for, for Headspace, uh, what are some of the things you're looking at? Well, I, I, you know, I agree with, with, with everything um, Kenny said from a defense perspective. The first question I think that's really important when you're defending um, is, is what is the objective that you're actually trying to achieve? And that's a, as much an economic question as it is a, a, a legal question if you're sitting there um, in the large corporation. Um, I think my recollection is this social media company is, I think, uh, based in Washington State, so I expect it's got a US incorporation. And typically when you're dealing with those sorts of situations, um, I entirely agree with the point, it will be the exposure in the United States that will largely dictate, I think, the um, global strategy, not always, um, but certainly I think in the technology sector, which is what we're talking about here, um, you know, the, the, really the last thing you want is a punitive damages award in California or in Florida, or I don't know about Washington State, but I assume it, 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 it will be similar. Um, so that's the first question, is what's the objective? And there will be various perspectives on this. Um, some clients that I've dealt with will want to take a scorched earth, earth approach and will never settle and will never settle at any particular point because they have so many of these cases that um, being seen to settle or being seen to um, demonstrate any form of weakness will just have such a significant economic impact um, upon the business that they can't afford to do it. Um, versus, on the other hand, others see it as a way of damage control, um, containing the losses at a reasonably early stage, particularly if there's a suspicion that there is going to be a finding about liability. You know, this is quite a, you know, we've, we've had um, quite a lot of public attacks in this scenario. We've got the word conspiracy. We've got multiple class actions here. Um, I could see if you were a technology company, um, a very successful technology company as this one is, um, you may be more willing to settle at an earlier stage because um, this may not be annihilatory damages, it may not be existential, but it may just be material for your business and you make that decision as an economic matter. Of course, you have impacts on shareholder prices, um, market disclosures, all those types of things. So um, to come back to the question, what do you do about Washington State? Um, well, I think you would have to assess it alongside all of the risks that you've got in different markets and jurisdictions around the world. One of the things I've been thinking about listening to Kenny and Mike and the, the gentleman from Portugal um, just before is one of the really interesting questions I think in Europe is how it, 
how are, when, once this directive that Kenny was referring to is introduced, how are all the jurisdictions going to interact with each other? And I was thinking about what the, the, the Portuguese speaker was saying before. Um, if it requires a million euros to get a finding in Portugal, then you choose your market, um, and then you think about how the Brussels regulation may then link in and then bind what happens in other European markets. I think that's going to be a really interesting question, particularly uh, for European U Union member states, is what is the impact of the Collective Redress Directive across borders? From Australia, from Canada, from the United States, there are quite strict rules about how these sort of collective proceedings are managed. Um, I think that's an open question in Europe, and it'll be an interesting one to explore. All right, so let's talk a little bit about coordination between the two defendants. So I'm going to ask both of the lawyers here on the defense side um, of their thoughts, and then I'll ask Mike how he's going to respond to that strategy. But um, we've got a, um, uh, obviously both a privacy element here and an antitrust element. Um, we're getting sued in the same cases, um, in some cases and not all cases. Some of the cases are being brought individually against one of the defendants. Um, uh, I'll start with Kenny again. What's your, what's your thought in terms of, of how that coordination should work and what are some of the pitfalls to um, coordinating between the two defendants? Yeah, so um, I mean there's absolutely no reason in principle why defendants wouldn't coordinate subject to protecting confidentiality and uh, common interest privilege. And it will depend on the case, however, because if the allegation is of uh, antitrust collusion, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, you know, particularly the in-house counsel uh, will be quite sensitive to that because there's a lot of the, you know, there is a public arena in which these cases are fought out as well. And, and you know, it could be, you know, people would be concerned it's not a very good look. But there are legitimate, of course, areas um, entirely legitimate areas uh, to discuss with one another uh, and they can also lead to efficiencies and assist the court as well so there are you know there's a hard edge point there that that, that that shouldn't be used against defendants very much depend on the claim um, also it will depend on the fact pattern um, if the allegations against the defendants are, are substantially similar in terms of facts that's one thing and they're much more likely to be aligned on those points there may be different quantum ar arguments against each other but for other uh, types of cases, not in our scenario, the allegations differ, you know, product liability cases and whatnot. There can be different allegations and they may wish to take substantially different positions and not even wish to be associated even, even on, on any basis with other defendants. So I'm afraid the short answer is it depends, um, but uh, it is certainly an area to be, to be looked at very carefully. And I assume, Jeremy, you agree it depends, but what are some of the factors that you're going to be looking at? Uh, I, think it, I think it depends on the, um, the, the, fact, the fact pattern and the particular character of the allegations that we're dealing with. I think there is definitely um, a, a spectrum between, um, you know, particularly some of the product liability cases um, can have um, very um, difficult facts and you may be seen to be wanting to deal with that independently. Um, particularly if you've got suppliers in your supply chain, it may depend upon the, the, the findings from the regulators. Uh, it may depend upon your regulatory relationships that you're, you're actually dealing with. Do you want to be seen in front of the regulator to be coordinating with someone that you're trying to blame um, for, for, for what happened? Or in fact, that person may be to blame. So there are a whole lot of different factors. And um, this is one of the things that I find really interesting about class actions is that there are so many different, there's the regulatory aspect, which is often your frontline defense um, you've got to have your litigation sitting there dealing with it at an early stage. But it's actually these regulatory questions, I think, that, that um, dictate largely the direction um, that the litigation um, will, will, will subsequently take. So, Mike, when it comes time to trying to develop the factual record for all these different cases, you've got all these different jurisdictions, uh, what's the focus going to be on the plaintiff's side in trying to develop the, uh, the facts and the discovery in, in the various cases? So, so I think that that, that some, to some extent really does depend on the jurisdiction. So in a, in a place like Canada, where, uh, and I think the UK, for example, where you will have at best very limited discovery of the facts prior to um, certification motion, um, the, the, the focus will be on developing just enough evidence, probably with experts uh, involved, from your own side, from our own side, from the plaintiff's side, just enough evidence to get through the certification hurdles. Um, and those are essentially having some evidence uh, uh, of the elements of the certification test, you know, commonality, um, you know, that there are common issues, that there is a class, that kind of thing. Evidence of those kinds of things. 
And despite the fact that for the most part, in most jurisdictions where there's a certification statute, you don't really need to have any real evidence of the underlying offense, most judges kind of like to hear there's a real thing there, you didn't just make it up. So some evidence of that as well. So that's what would happen in most places. Again, the United States is often a bit different. It would be an outlier to some extent because there probably would be very early discovery requests, depositions, things like that. There would be evidence being developed from the defendants here um, early on, which, which, is, which is difficult and requires coordination. And because of, of international rules of sharing of evidence and in many places like not just Canada, I know but Canada has this uh, of implied undertakings that you can't take evidence from another jurisdiction and share it somewhere else and you can't give evidence from your own jurisdiction and share it somewhere else. So those things are difficult. So you can't actually develop that evidence in the US and then export the evidence, just you know, copy the, the uh, thumb drives and send it around to all the other plaintiff's lawyers. What you can of course do though is uh, coordinate, bring in, bring in other lawyers from the, from the group of, of plaintiff's firms as co-counsel into the American cases, then they're allowed to see the documents at least, they can read the, the attorney work product that is come from the documents, and then they can certainly ask the questions. In Canada, for example, on a certification motion, um, a defendant would be, is obligated to, to, to file some evidence to respond to all the points. Usually that's, um, in my experience, a 22-year-old risk management associate who was hired the day before they were obligated to sign the swear the affidavit. <laughs> but we do get an opportunity to cross-examine that witness, and if we know the documents that exist, we can at least ask questions about what kind of documents might exist and get some, some things that way. And lots of jurisdictions can do that kind of thing. But again, I would say that the 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 evidentiary piece, the, the moving the case forward piece would be going on two tracks. The US track would be much more focused on what really happened here. Build the, um, the um, outrage level to a point where the jury will do whatever you want even if there isn't a causation piece. Whereas in the most of the rest of the common law world at least, um, you're gonna have to get through all those, co those causation pieces because we're unlikely to have a jury. Um, and our certification a test might be more robust than, than at least in some jurisdictions in the US where, um, as we say sometimes in Canada, we could get this thing certified in Mississippi on a drive-by. So. Well, speaking of uh, Mississippi, King County, Washington turns out to be the <laughs> new Mississippi. Um, and so I'm gonna add to the fact pattern now. Um, I am re representing um, Headspace in this, in this uh, smallish, class action case just involving the uh, Washington residents who were affected by this alleged scandal. Um, and we're in a state court proceeding. We can't remove it to federal court because the way that the removal uh, statute works in the US, if it's 100% uh, um, of the population of the class is in a given state and the defendant is a resident of that state, you can't remove it to federal court. You're stuck in state court. Um, and uh, King County, in, 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 uh, which is where Seattle is, is, um, is a fairly plaintiff friendly jurisdiction. And um, generally speaking, the judges there are predisposed to grant certification regardless of what the facts are. And um, that's what's going on in this case. The, uh, the judge has, has put us on a really um, fast schedule. We're gonna be doing discovery. We've argued that the discovery should be limited to just class certification facts. The judge says, well, you know, the US Supreme Court said in the Walmart case that um, you have to delve into the merits, and so I'm going to allow discovery on everything. And of course, then Mike's group, the first thing they do is they want to know all about Mr. Cobain and what he knows about the conspiracy. And so all the, the, that information is going to come out um, in this case in Washington State. So based on um, that fact pattern, I'll start with Jeremy this time. Um, you know, given that, that we're, we're stuck with the fact that we're going to end up with all these facts that are being generated yeah. out of this proceeding in Washington State, um, how does that impact your, your sort of planning for the overall strategy and developing the, the, the discovery strategy worldwide? Um, unfortunately, it's all linked, and I think that you know your, glo your, your strategy, for, uh, you know, a global. This is a global case. One of the one of the challenges and problems of these data and competition cases is that they, and it's I think why they're particularly attractive um, to claimant lawyers is just the geographical spread. Um, so I think you'll get. A, a 
depends what a lawyer's answer. Um, but it depends how the, you know, precisely what they're pushing on in, in Washington and how it in, would interact with Europe. I think there's an Australian angle here and, and wherever else that you're going. But, but largely, I think that you're going to have to um, um, press forward. If Washington is moving faster um, than the other parts, um, you're going to have to push forward with engaging with the Washington state courts, um, whether you, you like it or not. Um, there may be um, more capacity to, I think, resist in the United States um, some kinds of disclosure that you might, for example, um, in this country where there is a greater burden, I think, to try and um, confer uh, and reach agreements about particular types of discovery um, or, or disclosure. And, of course, then there are questions about the extent to which you can access um, evidence that is coming out in the United States and bring it into European or, or, or other proceedings, Canada, uh, wherever you are. Um, and there are different mechanisms that we're all aware of um, that you can you, you can do that. Um, you know, there are collateral undertakings that we've mentioned, but you can also look at things like the Hague Convention, I think it's called the, the 1782 statute um, that you have out of New York State if you're um, dealing with that there. Um, and then you have to balance that against a whole lot of other things that are going on. For example, if anyone's ever tried to extract evidence out of France, if you try, if we substitute France for, for Washington State, you're dealing with the blocking statute um, in France. So it's really complicated, um, is the answer. But I, I think it's a question of where is the particular risk that you are dealing with? Um, is there a way that you can stop what's going on in Washington State, which doesn't blow up uh, and cause massive reputational uh, damage, whether that's with the court in Washington or whether it's um, more broadly, um, but largely, I think you would have to you would have to um, engage with what is going on and, and then mitigate risk. And that goes back to the point I made earlier, which is what, what's the objective that you're trying to um, achieve? Is what's going on in Washington State is that the trigger um, where the client says, "Look, I think we're going to have to contain this because we really don't want Mr. Cobain's." evidence and all of these documents coming out into the public domain and there may be a price that you pay for that because this is I think largely an economic process that is going on as much as a legal and reputational process. Yeah. And, and you know if we think about this particular fact pattern we've got um, this case in Washington State they're asking for statutory damages it's one of those cases that even though it's a state court class action in the US the potential exposure could be in the billions of dollars given the number of people that were affected and the potential for statutory damages. And so the cost of resolving this one case, the plaintiffs could be demanding $100 million as sort of a, a starting bid for the for the resolution of it. And so to Jeremy's point, the, the client is going to have to consider, is it worth paying $100 million to settle this little case in Washington State? to avoid the worldwide impact of the evidence coming out and becoming known to the plaintiff's lawyers. So now, um, Kenny's client has a different problem, and that is that um, they've, they've got this co-defendant that is in this case that they're not a party to, um, but a lot of the evidence that's coming out is about a conspiracy that affects, or allegedly affects, um, his client. So give us your thoughts in terms of, you know, kind of what are you advising your client uh, to do or, or um, uh, about what the risks that they face resulting from all this. Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, just one point as well on the uh, proliferation piece as well. The the, um, the 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 dynamic of settling to reduce uh, discovery as well, particularly in opt-in jurisdictions where uh, claimant law firms have to persuade people to join groups. Uh, settlements have, of course, got a particular risk uh, where they take the view, rightly or wrongly, and, and sometimes wrongly, well, they'll be willing to settle in our jurisdiction. Also, it may have been because there was a discovery risk, but where there is a settlement, that can encourage. Uh, uh, claims and can assist on book builds. In terms of documentary evidence and uh, dealing with disclosure, um, we've, we've touched on a, a couple of times, you know, claimants getting a hold or using, leveraging uh, different discovery rules across different countries. Um, but a point I'd like to make as well, and, and, and this is very true in, in relation to concealed cartels as well, is that the defendant themselves has to get on top of the facts very, very quickly. Um, if you're dealing with uh, uh, jurisdictions where you can move into court proceedings quite quickly and you have to take a position, then you have to be pretty sure that that the position is, is accurate and is going to be inert and is not going to be uh, prejudicial to you later on. And that's quite a challenge uh, because where you're talking about that sort of conduct, uh, it will be very frequently mid to seniorish level executives who are doing something that is not known to the internal compliance, is not endorsed by the board, um, and which has been concealed even from uh, uh, the in-house lawyers. So you've got to get on top of those facts very, very quickly. And not just the facts, but also the non-smoking guns 
the uh, emails that could be taken that are out of context, um, which actually look like there is something going wrong there uh, when actually there isn't, and there is a proper explanation. So, kind of my point there as well is these are very much crisis management situations where you've got to get on top of it very, very fast and then work out what is safe to say, what you're comfortable saying. Well, and that's a, it's an interesting point because what's going to come out of the Washington proceeding is going to be pretty one-sided to start with. Mm. It's, it's going to be all of the evidence, for the most part, is going to be coming from the defendant. It's going to be coming from Headspace, um, their witnesses. It'll be the plaintiff's lawyers asking them questions and really not their side of the story. It'll be deposition testimony. Um, there won't be any meaningful hearing until potentially we get to a class certification hearing, which you've heard other panelists talk about in the U.S. could be an evidentiary hearing, but a lot of times it's just oral argument. And so a lot of the evidence that, that's going to come out early is going to look very damning simply because it's one-sided. Um, it's just the nature of, of, the, of the proceeding. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I wanted to go through with each of our panelists and, and kind of ask for kind of final takeaways, and then maybe we'll have five minutes left for, for any questions from the audience. Uh, so, Mike, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so, I mean, I think uh, the way that the, the, the story built there, um, I would say that it, at this, you know, key point in, in, in King County, in Seattle, you know, um, there would be a lot of people flying into Seattle and Steve Berman's Gulfstream 5. Uh, he's a plaintiff lawyer in Seattle and L.A. Um, and probably is one of the leads on this case in the U.S. And, and, and ultimately... Well, what that would also mean is there would be one or two very senior defense lawyers who know Steve and would be saying at this point, okay, how many people around the world are you involved with here? Could we do a, 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 a settlement that involves a U.S. class proceeding with foreign opt-in classes, that kind of thing? Is there a way to, to put a ring around this so that we don't, have to go too much further on this annoying litigation. I think that is a fairly common uh, and fairly likely kind of scenario that would happen here. And it's the it's why, in some ways, um, once this this thing got out, this this um, this alleged conspiracy, uh, it's in some ways, even for defendants, that class actions can be a good thing. It's a way of of limiting the the, the downstream liability probably not including the regulators, but sometimes even the regulators will get on board with the right kind of resolution because they really want to put, um, they might have a terms or a series of terms that they want involved in the settlement, but, but that is sometimes doable as well. So I think it could be a good thing for everyone. Jeremy? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to make more of a, a commercial point, which is um, this, this scenario has been about um, data and competition, and I think particularly over the last week in this country, um, there's been a real discussion about is this the end of um, data class actions. I think what, what comes out and what's been coming out to me over the course of this conference is um, we're just at the beginning in Europe um, of this whole world of collective litigation. Um, Australia, where I trained originally, is probably 30 years ahead of where the European market is in the United States. I think just celebrated its 50th anniversary of class action litigation. We have to kind of feel out um, how this is all going to work in Europe. And I certainly think that there are avenues, and I can see some respected opponents um, sitting in the room here, um, there are avenues for you guys um, with, with, with class actions both in the United Kingdom um, and in Europe. And that's what we're going to have to watch. Um, I think that there is um, companies, particularly European companies, um, I have a sense that um, they are not necessarily as attuned to this risk as you might have, as you might find with North American or Australian businesses, because it is relatively new. And I think the big question, that if you're, a, you're an in-house lawyer and you're thinking about, is um, when the crisis happens that Kenny was talking about, um, do we have in place the internal systems and procedures for recognising the crisis and making sure that it's um, managed through in a way that you can get to an economically and legally and reputationally rational conclusion? Thanks, Kenny. Final, final comments. Yeah, just a brief comment from me, which is really the um, you know the defence coordination piece really is the uh, corollary of the plaintiff coordination as well, and the coordination only arises when there is risk where in these jurisdictions these claims can credibly now be brought and we are at the early stage of that but it's I mean the conference in London the fact that there's so many eminent uh, you know people coming over from other jurisdictions really does demonstrate I think 
that, that, that this is now happening and that corporates do need to be aware of that. And, and, and it just emphasizes that coordination is no longer theoretical, it, it really is real and important. And my final comment is, Headspace will never settle. We'll see you in court, Mr. Peerless. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Leonita McArdle asks, using this fact pattern with so many interested parties from both the claimant and defendant perspective, with many law firms managing the various claimant interest and various defendant interests on a practical level, how much time and consideration is given to trying to act cooperatively in alignment and ensuring there is a coherent strategy? You want to start that one? Mike? Yeah, I mean, so I, how much time and effort? It would take a lot of time and effort. Um, would it be enough? Um, and, and, and ultimately, um, as plaintiff's lawyers who do this kind of thing, we, we do have a bit of a challenge in that, in that area because we're, we're our main client is our own class, say, or our, our main, our, our, our own individual group of cases. But if we're trying to do it cooperatively, we may have to share, trade, um, and we have to balance those interests, and sometimes they're difficult to do. Um, one, I'll give us a simple example, and that is, I've been involved in many cases where, the, where cases have settled around the world for um, products liability matters where there's been a personal injury of some kind. Um, if the plaintiff groups all said, well, American plaintiffs are all getting $50,000, so we have to get $50,000 as well for each of our people, we would never get the cases done because it wouldn't be rational because the, the, the damages, if we took the cases to court, would be much lower in most jurisdictions than they would be in the U.S. And if you, if you, until and unless you recognize that as counsel, you're not doing your own clients any favors. But that's an example of how that balancing between the whole group and your own group sometimes is difficult. And it can be difficult to have those conversations where, um, you know, breast implant claimants in the United States are getting an average of $50,000, and that's in the media, and I have to tell my clients that we're getting 25000 And that's because we don't have treble damages statutes, we don't have punitive damages, we don't have juries. Mm -hmm. So it's different. Yeah, and I, th I, I think also, you know, the... the um Claimant lawyers and defence lawyers have different personalities. You know, we, we, we've seen that in some of the Volkswagen litigation that's taken place in this country, where there's been a degree of competition between different claimant groups, and that is a lever that you can pull on, on the defence side. And um, similarly, I, you know, you, you can see in certain cases where you've got multiple defendants, um, different defendants have different personalities and different risk appetites. Some just want to just make this go away, and others want to fight, fight, fight. And different lawyers also. Um, want to play the defence in different ways where, where um, and, and that will often be dictated by clients, but it might also just reflect the particular areas of practice where they come from. I think one of the things that I find quite distinct about the UK market um, is we tend to be pan-class action lawyers. In the United States, you're a privacy class action lawyer or a consumer class action lawyer or a product liability um, class action lawyer. Here, because we're a smaller market, you tend to, you tend to cover greater ground and that the approaches that you take I think can also influence the types of defense and the way you coordinate. That's why Headspace has hired him to coordinate and not me. I'm just a <laughs> privacy lawyer. <laughs> Kenny, any other thoughts on that question? I think um, you know the the interests of unrepresented class members who don't have a voice is just you know, it's a fundamental policy question to do with the whole concept of class actions uh, and disappointment or people who are passive didn't even know they're part of the class goes to the fundamental policy concern of do governments wish to have these, um, uh, these, these claims. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a, um, a comment as well, which is a partisan point uh, about access to justice and you know, the, uh, the, the, the role of class actions as well, because um, access to justice is a, a good. It cannot, there, is nothing, you know, there is nothing bad that can be said about access to justice. But there is, a, you know, there is a question mark over the, deg the degree and proportion of which damages do actually get distributed to class members, particularly where the individualized damages are low, because it's been said to me every opt-out mechanism ultimately is opt-in at the distribution level. Um, so there is a whole, and, and that ultimately I think should be a question for government um, about how they wish to have um, these sorts of cases run and whether they should be available to such large groups. Well, thank you. I think we're out of time and really appreciate the uh, audience's attention.